Welcome to Pop Screen. We are the Geek Show podcast dedicated to reviewing films starring by or about pop stars. Uh, no other pop music or movie podcast covers such a broad range of musical and cinematic genres from country and western to hip-hop, from documentaries to science fiction. I'm Graham Williamson. I'm a film critic for thegeekshow.co.uk and Horrified, and I also appear on the Geek Show's Director's Lottery podcast. And this week I've been joined by... Uh, Ewan Gledo. And people can find you on? Uh, people can find me on Cult Following, Geek Show, Clapper and Northern Lights at Ewan Gledo. Well, I suppose I should have seen it coming, really. I'd just finished organising the church tombola when I found out my Garibaldi biscuit was a paedophile. Oh, sorry, that's Alan Bennett's talking heads. Uh, this is the one led by a man with a party in his mind, and he hopes it never stops, David Byrne. After the success of their Jonathan Demme-directed concert film Stop Making Sense, Byrne was given carte blanche for a strange film project based on stories he clipped from local newspapers when he was on tour. The result is a true one-off, a Criterion collection honorary, and a really cool multi-purpose movie. These are true stories. <laughs> I was pleased when I came up with that introduction as well. That was, that was brilliant, yeah. I think that sets the tone for the mood of true stories quite nicely it, it's <laughs> funny isn't it yeah because this if alvin bennett lived in texas you can imagine he would have come up with something a bit like true stories oh absolutely i, I don't know if he'd wear the cowboy hat though i think he would <laughs> I, I, I want to dream <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's it, it has that uh, Alan Bennett's Talking Heads kind of ethos of just being a, a, a collection of stories about ordinary life and ultimately stories about ordinary life that prove that it is quite strange. Um, yeah. Like I say, the, the genesis of it was that it was that when Byrne was on tour with Talking Heads and they had stopped touring by this point, uh, he would make it a hobby to find little funny or strange stories in local papers and he took Stephen Toblowski the Texan actor raconteur and general man about town to his house and Toblowski's memory of it is like David Byrne's house has almost no furniture or anything that like a normal person would have in this house, but you just have this room full of newspaper <laughs> clippings. I mean, that's the most burn thing I could possibly think of. Just a room <laughs> with a singular chair, maybe a desk if he's lucky, just wall to floor, <laughs> or newspaper clippings of, you know, Florida woman wins best cake. Yes. <laughs> So it's it, Toblowski's script, which he co wrote with Beth Henley, didn't end up being the basis for the film. Uh, Byrne allowed them to keep credit partly because he was anxious that it would be seen as a vanity project if it was you know him directing, him starring, him writing the script. Uh, but it did have one strange uh, after effect that Toblowski told Byrne that during his childhood, he believed he could get like a tone from a person, that if he was walking near them, every person had a different tone, like an aura. And Byrne went away and wrote the song Radiohead about oh, that. Yeah. Right. See, when it comes to true stories, mm. I think if, if you talk to the average Talking Heads fan, fan You've got the album and then you've got the film. Yeah. If if I said, oh, have you seen? Have, if I said to you, what what is true stories? Would you straight away go to the film, or would it just be, oh, the album? It is a tricky one, isn't it? And I think maybe part of the reason why this film wasn't commercially successful is there is this question about what this is. Is it like? Is it a, a film meant to support the album? Is it like a long music video of the type that was starting to appear in the 80s? Or is the album a soundtrack? Well, it isn't really, because 
you know, none of the songs on the album are recordings from the film. It's the songs performed by Talking Heads rather than by the cast. So, yeah, I, I, I can't answer that because I don't think, like, even Sire Records did not come up with a way to answer that. It's kind of weird because I think if we take the big single from that album, Wild Wild Life, hmm. it uses footage from the film, but you never think oh, they've made a film to support the album or vice versa. It's sort of a happy coincidence that they have enough original material to make the soundtrack for a film. Mm. Yeah. Which is one of the many benefits of being in a band and making a film, I suppose. Yeah, I guess. But it never feels like, I mean, by like the late 80s, early 90s, you were getting this situation where most big films had singles released from the soundtrack and most of them had these videos that were just performance footage like artlessly cut together with clips from the film and even if you hadn't seen the film you could tell a mile off what had been shot for the video and what hadn't but Wild Wild Life and Love for Sale, the other single from the album, have videos that are basically taken with just a few tweaks from the footage yeah. in the movie and they still they still think like music videos, but equally when you watch the film, you don't think, oh, we've stopped for a music video. Yeah, it's. I mean, uh, you mentioned earlier that it it doesn't it isn't quite a vanity project. I don't think it is at all mm. a vanity project. I think it's quite the opposite. Where it's a nice happy coincidence that Byrne has able to incorporate his music into the narrative. It yeah. never feels like the narrative is making way for the music or the music's making way for the narrative. They come together quite nicely. Mm. And it's the fact that it's it's the circumstantial setting of, oh, we're in a karaoke bar where people are going to go up on stage and sing. What song will they sing? Well, it turns out to be a talking head song. Yeah. And it's it's quite nice that those two come together rather seamlessly. I am a big fan of the album True Stories. I'm aware that it's not sort of anyone's favourite Talking Heads album, but it's one that I find, like, it's a real sentimental favourite for me. And I think part of what I enjoy about it is that the songs are, are kind of slippery. You know, they all work within the film, but when you're listening to uh, people like us on the soundtrack, you don't think, ah, right, yeah, this was meant for John Goodman to sing. No, it, it just sounds like a Talking Heads song, except yeah. when it's in the film. It sounds naturally like a song John Goodman's character would sing. Well, it's... Um, I forgot what I was going to say now. It was about Wild Wild Life. It was... Um, yeah, it was... I, I think, again, it's coincidence that the songs sort of pair nicely with the films, but at the same time, they don't feel like they're written just for this scene or that scene. They feel like mm. Talking Heads products that can be released into the wild on their own. It just happens that there's a film to go with it. Um, I think the best example of that is Wild Wild Life, where, you know, the, the, the contrast of that is, you know, it's a song about wild wild life. The, the title itself, so it gives it away, but then you pair it with these very mundane, small city people that are just sort of mulling through life and just not really caring about the future. And it's those little contrasts, even if it's just in title, that yeah. Byrne presents with true stories that sort of brings that tabloid aspect together really nicely. I think one of the assets it has and one of the reasons why uh, this project has worked so well is that true stories does not have a narrative, a single narrative. So when you listen to one of the songs, just as, as a song, when you listen to Wild Wild Life as a single, and it was, uh, as you say, a pretty big hit, um, you never feel confused. You never feel like there's context that you're missing. You never feel like you have to watch a whole movie just to make sense of this song, because ultimately it, it is just one thread in a movie that has so many different intersecting stories. Yeah, and I think those intersecting stories sort of come together well enough to sort of form a fairly decent narrative because obviously the narrative to this is quite important. It's David Byrne driving around in the nice red convertible, just mm. sort of popping in like, like a, like a vicar in a little village sort of popping into people's lives, asking how they're doing and then sort of removing himself again. But it comes together as through themes. I think it comes together through the overarching theme that David Byrne wanted to 
investigate tabloid clippings. Mm. And it's weird because obviously we're in the UK, so tabloid clippings in the UK are quite ghoulish. But in America yeah. in the 1980s, it seems quite, you know, humdrum lifestyle, the the happy family that, you know, are just quite closed off from each other. I've got the, the Criterion. There's a really nice collection of essays in the Criterion uh, edition. But the presentation of them is through, like, you know, a little tabloid newspaper. And it looks like the inspiration that True Stories has gotten, like the newspaper Burns Holden on the poster. Yeah, yeah. It, it's about small town eccentrics, isn't it? It's not, as yeah. you say, the kind of the endless hunting for scandal or shock that you would associate with the British tabloids. Yeah. Um, I, I really love Burns' persona in it. Like you say, he is like the sort of town vicar coming to check on his flock. Yeah. And, uh, I think there is there is something so charming and guileless about his presentation as as a screen performer here. I don't know if this was a conscious choice. I don't know if he was kind of bored with being talked about as like this egghead who does loads of really difficult arty projects and he just wanted to play a guy who is what he seems like. But it's a fabulous, fabulous role. It's incredible, yeah. And I do think it's an intentional change of pace from the sort of egghead artist that he'd sort of become known for because his role is sort of, I think it's just the narrator. I don't think he's ever given a name. Yeah, that's um, correct. His role here, it comes across as quite airheaded, not stupid, yeah. but sort of earnest and well-meaning where he's driving along and his convertible says, oh, I've got an interesting fact about that, but I've left it at home. And it's <laughs> little, little lines like that that are really funny, but they sort of, flesh out the character in in sort of a way that only David Byrne could because they're handled with such care and it's very fragile but it's sort of it's not mean it's not intended to be you know a, a, a gutting horrible attack on anyone it's just sort of very nice sort of David Byrne trying to remove himself from a public persona that in part he created but more because of his collaborations with Brian Eno and the mm. press around that time he's sort of not I don't think he's ashamed of that to the point where he's using true stories to distance himself from it. I do think he's interested in a change of pace. And I think that explains the album that went along with it, True Stories, which is sort mm. of compared to the very artsy world music sounds of Remain in Light Speaking in Tongues. Wild Wild Life, it's not my favorite Tom Heads album. It's a very good album, but it's almost like you said, it's slippery. It's sort of these songs come together as they are rather mm. than having an overarching theme. It's poppier, I think, as an album. It is more compared to, as you say, the sort of world music stuff that they were starting to increasingly get into. It is more invested in uh, specifically American music styles, you know, like country and western, or the kind of New Orleans gumbo blues that you get on Papa Legba. Um, so that that's an interesting shift, and maybe I don't know. Maybe that is something that people thought was a step back, but I I really like it. I have a huge soft spot for country music, so yeah. I think it, it it was an inevitable change of pace because they'd always flirted with pop heavy songs, you know, not well not pop heavy, but sort of pop friendly. Hmm. Once in a lifetime, Psycho Killer, Strike, you know, they have the artistic elements of seventy seven and Remain in Light, but they also have very dependable uh, components that sort of present them as, you know, you can listen to this anytime and not yeah. take meaning from it. I think that's the overarching point for Wild Wild Life and the rest of the songs on True Stories is that they, they are deep, they have meaning, they have thematics, but they're not incredibly explosive ventures into new lands of music. Mm. I think to an extent it works better to do it like that because everyone's expecting this big explosion of you know fear and music fear of music and in return they get a very pop friendly soundtrack that talking heads have always tried to do but have never set in stone they've never yeah. gone full fully ahead with that and i think the songs are, are still written ambiguously enough that they can change their meaning depending on the context they're in i mean one of uh, my favourite sequences in the film is the scene uh, where the kids are singing Hey Now, 
Yeah. And I mean, that's just a beautiful shot as well. We should point out that this film is shot by Ed Lackman, uh, who most recently, uh, well, he's, he just does a lot of stuff all the time, but his biggest film of the last few years was Cavill, uh, the Todd Haynes movie. Oh, mm. he did is... Dark Waters as well, didn't he? Uh, the Mark I, Ruffalo film. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised because I, I yeah. assumed Haynes would stay with him because Man Cavill is a gorgeous looking movie. Fantastic. I but, think that sort of transpires in true stories there as well. Yeah, yeah, because it, it is a really visually strong film. It is so colourful and there's a, a cleanness and spaciousness to the visuals that makes sense. And I think that's intentional not just from Lackman's perspective but Burns as well he wants to bring apart this sleek America the sleepy yeah. town that's sort of very traditional the very plain almost but mm. there are eccentrics in that plainness in that sort of mundanity that are bubbling up to the surface maybe out of their feeling of mediocrity because I think one of the big themes for true stories is understanding mediocrity in mediocre places yeah. A lot of these people just, you know, John Goodman comes across as the, the, the adverts he does for the television where it's like, I'm single. And it's, what was it he says? He says, I'm big like a bear or something like that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I have a consistent panda shape. <laughs> That's the one. <laughs> I have a consistent panda shape and it's sort of, nobody would ever say that. Yeah. But it feels so natural here. It doesn't feel out of place. And I think that's the crucial part of true stories is that it's odd little lines and odd throwaway jokes and gags that feel very comfortable in where they are. I think one of my big quibbles with social realism as a, a cinematic genre is that when you shave everything back to just things that appear absolutely plausible you lose the sense of what real life is because everyday life does involve beautiful things and it does involve strange things and it does involve quite a lot of stuff that is utterly inexplicable all of which you get a lot of in true stories to me, this makes it feel more realistic than a Ken Loach movie. Yeah, definitely. I think it's sort of the disconnect between what David Byrne as a narrator is saying and what he's trying to convey as a director. It's sort of the comfortable middle ground between this is what I mean and this is sort of what I'm hinting at. It's like a nice middle ground where it's just sort of he's coasting along, just uttering you know, nonsense in a red convertible <laughs> where while John Goodman and, you know, Spalding Gray sort of just litter around in the background. And then as a director, he's really intent on bringing to life these eccentrics. I think there is one moment where Burns' approach as a director and Burns' approach as a narrator absolutely come together. And I think if, if you say this part of the film is like ironic or satirical, I think you're flat out wrong. You know, I'm I'm going to put my foot down. Uh, but it's when they're driving through that neighbourhood and the camera just points out of the window at all of the garages and bungalows passing by and Burn just says, I mean, look at that. Who could say that isn't beautiful? And I think that's it. That's the absolute heart of the film right there because I think yeah. it absolutely, sincerely means that. Yeah, and I think the, the misconception there is because Talking Heads' popular songs were very, you know, focused on deconstructing middle-class suburban lifestyles, whereas True Story sort of uses it as a comfort, as, as a blanket for healthy, happy living. So I do think Byrne has written, you know, satirical jabs at that culture. I think True Stories is a genuine love letter, not love letter, no, but sort of, it's not ill-intentioned it's not mean-spirited it is quite a nice sort of look at this world and thinking it is quite nice isn't it that comfort that yeah. security it goes back to an essential sort of problem i've always had with films about suburbs and small towns which is that the the average attitude that a uh, I mean, obviously, there were great films made about the suburbs, like Blue Velvet, but a bog-standard film about the suburbs 
the attitude is always look at these places they're like dull robot factories populated by zombies everything is so conformist but the story of these films is usually about some bizarre like wife swapping ring or some like gangsters operating or something and you think how ordinary is this exactly because i'm pretty sure what you're showing me is a bit strange well that's the thing they use it as a they use that mundanity as a backdrop to counteract the more eccentric moments to say like this could happen anywhere and in reality you get something closer to what true stories represent it's just happy people that are sort of content i don't think actually you know i don't think there's anyone in true stories that is happy i think everybody is very content i think it, yeah yeah that's a very good way of putting it everyone is looking for something but it's not like gnawing away at them yeah I think that that is the suburban lifestyle, though. It's being content mm. with the security provided, but it's not, you know, reaching for the stars, you know? it's Yeah. And I think people sort of forget how much of a promise that was at one point, because the suburbs start expanding just as you're going out of World War II. Uh, before World War II, in Britain at least, you have this terrible yeah. problem of slum housing. Um so the the idea that you're going to go out into this like nice place around the edges of town and live in a two up two down house with the kids and a garden gnome by the ponds is is not like the horrifying fate that a lot of songwriters and film directors would have you think it is like compared to living in a lice infested slum that's being bombed by the fucking Luftwaffe it's actually quite nice I mean, I've lived in Sunderland, but, you know, it's close enough. I think there's, if obviously we're looking at this with contemporary perspective, sort mm. of. Um, I think what I drew from this, though, is that I think what David Byrne is trying to say with parts of this is that there is nothing wrong with being content, being happy with this sort of, you know, very secure lifestyle. Mm. But there is an issue with not wanting more. Yeah, because these characters have things that they want. You know, John Goodman's trying to find a wife, and there's the I can't remember her name, but she's she's you know bed bound not because she's got an illness, but because she's got nothing to do. Yeah, and it's that that truly that does scare me in my life having that level of placidity where I'm just yeah. sort of sat and I'm doing nothing and I'm just sort of comfortable. And it's sort of, the, these characters are not challenged by anything. And I do think that's the point where a, a, any little oddity, like there's the fashion show in the shopping mm -hmm. mall. Yeah. And it's it's that line. It's the shopping mall has replaced the town centre. Yeah. And it's, that that I think that that's struck more of a note now than it, I think Byrne could have known. Oh God, it does now, because now you watch it and you think, well, we don't even have shopping malls anymore. Yeah. So what is it now? I mean, yeah. especially like from from where I'm from, the big shopping centre is you know forty minutes away. Yeah. So we make do with you know rows and rows of like charity shops and bookstores and little oddities like that. So there is that sort of town centre nature to where I'm from. But if you go to a city where I used to live, and it's sort of that is the shopping mall is the central location. You cannot go beyond it if you want mm. sort of society as that is in there if you want to sort of go outside and venture beyond the shopping center you're going to find odd people like this yeah and that's a big fear for a lot of for a lot of normal people yeah yeah i mean for, for me yeah I, I find that stuff energizing i remember when i went to university in newcastle it was I just used to go out to pubs and try and see if I could attract some weirdo to come and have a rambling conversation <laughs> with me, which was very easy. I don't oh, know yeah. why, but they're eccentrics. It was, you know, I used to I used to go out a lot in Sunderland, and there was the the big thing that I noticed was you'd have the the morning people and the night people are yeah. so different. It's two different worlds almost. You know, you've got the mundanity that comes with just you know you do your shopping, you go to work, you go home. And then you watch TV, which is sort of what happens in true stories. But then you've got the nightlife present as well, which is everyone's trying to loosen themselves away from that structure. Yeah. They're trying to energize themselves to that point where they did have ambitions. And that's present in true stories as well. Everybody mm -hmm. convenes at the same location to do the same things on a night. But it is their sense of sort of freedom where 
they can do karaoke, they can have a few drinks and they can mingle and socialise. And that's a stunningly well observed thing for someone who had had no reason to live a normal life for like the thick end of a decade at this point. You know, for someone yeah. who's done world tours to be able to recognise that kind of structure to every day, you know, nine to five jobs and the way that that creates a certain lifestyle is, is really humane and, and important, I think. Yeah, definitely. I think it's, you know, he didn't want things to stop making sense. <laughs> I knew I'd get one in. <laughs> There's no way I couldn't. But yes, I think this sort of feels like David Byrne is, you know, David Byrne was a world star and he still is. You know, he travels, mm. well, when, when he can, he travels the world and he tours in all these amazing locations. But there is a sense in true stories of sort of regret. It's when, when he does go past those garages and says, aren't they beautiful? And aren't they amazing? There is a, a, a little tinge of sort of, if I hadn't been a world famous pop star and moved yeah. around the country, artistic innovator, then this is what I could have had. And it, and it I feels think, like he's yeah. guilty. I think that's what makes Hey Now so interesting to me, because when you see it in the film, it is just pure joy. You know, it's just kids making a racket and singing along to this really catchy song. But when you hear your talking heads do it on the album, of course there is this sense of pain and wistfulness to it because it is, you know, an audibly adult man singing about, you know, bubblegum and going down to the candy store and things. There has to be this sense of loss to it. Yeah. And I think what surprises me most about True Stories, and I assume it's because it was on a different album, is how well Road to Nowhere fits in with the narrative, but mm. it's just not there. It's not included. And I understand why, because that is a bit on the nose for what yeah. Burns presenting. But it's right at the end. And I think it's sort of the Mandela effect where I thought that was the end credit song. <laughs> I always thought Road to Nowhere was the last song that played because it's the road and it is literally leading nowhere. Yeah. <laughs> but I don't know. Because <laughs> um, I watched it recently. I got, I got the criterion and I watched it and I thought, I just, brilliant stuff from the first time I watched it it's improved tenfold it's sort of the very fun, one of the yeah. it's one of the first pieces I wrote with the geek show was on true stories and I said it's this community value and it gets that to some extent and then you re-watch it and it's sort of it, not to an extent he gets it completely he hits the nail on the head with this presentation of how middle class sort of almost working class nearly sort of mm. acclimatizing to a very fast-paced changed culture you've got that scene with Spalding Gray where he's at the dinner table and he's explaining how business is going to change yeah and sort of that change came quicker than people at this time were expecting yeah absolutely it had a similar change to me I remember really loving it when I first saw it but part of me looking back thought is that just because you know I love Talking Heads and it's a fun novelty and, you know, it's got John Goodman in and what isn't improved with a bit of John Goodman. And, Flintstones. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what other than the Flintstones? Even then, you can say that Even if, then, yeah. if the Flintstones didn't have John Goodman, it would be the Flintstones in Viva Rock Vegas. So oh. it was improved. Yeah, yeah the Flintstones, John Goodman and Kyle McLaughlin did some very heavy lifting there. <laughs> yes. <God. laughs> So the, I, I thought it was just that. I thought it was like a, a cute novelty that I was very impressed by. Uh, but watching it again, it, it's become a real favourite of mine because, as you say, I do think it has that kind of wistful, emotional depth that people often miss about David Byrne's work in general, I think. Yeah, absolutely. I think... Because if you listen, you know, if you just stick a talking head song on, I think any of their songs has the, that very, very rare mix of entirely listenable. You can just listen to that as a bit of entertainment and move mm. on. But the songs themselves, the lyrics, if you actually listen and you pick them apart, you realise this is really heavy stuff for what is essentially in the later stages of their career, especially in true stories, is pop songs. Yeah. And I think that's the beauty of Wild Wild Life. It's that disconnect between an actual wild lifestyle and sort of the conformity of you know middle class suburbia yeah and it, it you mentioned Spalding Gray's character uh 
that originally was going to be tied together a bit more as well uh, because the kids who were doing the double ventriloquist act at the talent show at the end yeah uh, originally it was made clear that they are uh, Spalding Gray and what's the actress's name? Uh, Annie McEnroe. Yes. Spalding Gray and Annie McEnroe's character's kids and they're right. acting out the conversations that their parents can't have. Uh, but a lot of that was cut. There was a lot of stuff to do with that talent show that was cut because it was just felt like it, it rounded everything off in too neat a way. As it is, I think the only character at the end who has a real epiphany and who changes is Swoozy Curtis's character. Yeah. And I think that's a that's probably the right decision. Definitely, yeah, because I don't think the point of true stories is to have these characters feel enlightened or yeah. that a new chapter of their life is beginning. The, the whole point of true stories is you can have um, sort of acceptance of the usual way of living. You can live like this and enjoy life. I think what Byrne is trying to present is that there is a cap to how much you can enjoy. That there is yeah. a certain limit that you'll hit, you'll hit the roof and you'll not be able to go any further. And there is that epiphany at the end that realizes, you know, she's hit where she can go in this current lifestyle. You know, she's not gonna have a wild, wild life, but she's gonna have to break through. And it's I, I kind of like the fact that none of the characters aside from her have that epiphany because mm. they're so content, they're so blinded by you know, they've got a family life or they're so fixated on one angle. Yeah. Like John Goodman with the, the dating tips that it's sort of, they, they, they want one thing so much that they can't see the bigger picture. Yeah. And I think part of the film's graciousness is that it acknowledges that if you can enjoy that ceiling, you know, if you can enjoy life below the kappa for what you can achieve in suburbia, that's great. So there's that lovely speech that uh, Spalding Gray gives at the uh, ceremony where he says that Texas was invented because God was building it. And he thought, right, I'm going to go back to that and put some swamps and some rivers and some other things that places have in later on so man can enjoy it. And he got distracted. And when he came back, the earth was just baked through. So rather than change it, he said, well, I'm going to make some folks that like it that way. <laughs> and of course, Spalding Gray's character would say that because he is definitely, out of all the characters in the film, the folk who likes it that way. Yeah, absolutely. And I think if you take Spalding Gray as who he was as a performer and as a, um, what's the word? He's not a comedian, but he's sort of a, a performance artist he know. was often he tended to get described as a monologist which is an yeah. awfully specific job but <laughs> like you say he isn't quite a comedian he is very funny and he does something yeah. that looks like stand-up but it's not quite that i think it's his observations because i remember watching swim to cambodia and i never thought oh that's funny mm. but overall it was sort of a his points are great and he's told them in an entertaining way and he does that here as well where he's saying well he's made folk that like the place that's sort of present now everywhere mm. if you go to a town and if you just went up to someone's like do you enjoy it here they'll probably just go yeah it's all right yeah it's never yeah. It, what, a, what an amazing place to live what, look at these sights and sounds it's sort of just the yeah i'm content and that's the whole message in true stories is that people are content and there's nothing wrong with that yeah, I haven't seen Swimming to Cambodia. Uh, that was Jonathan Demi, wasn't it, who yes, directed yeah. that? So I assume that there must be some kind of conversation between Byrne and Demi that yeah. one must have alerted the other to Spalding Gray. Well, I think when David Byrne tried to make true stories, he went to Jonathan Demi after, on, on, on sort of the, the court tales of Stop Making Sense and said, I want to make a project. And I think that's how he did the soundtrack for Married to the Mob. Ah. And after that, he went to do true stories because he had sort of the confidence of, you know, getting to know the business. Yeah. And um, I think it's, I think as well, that's why he sort of uses uh, Beth Henley and Stephen Tobolowsky as the scriptwriters. He's sort of using them not as a crutch, but because he's not fully confident in his abilities as a director, which is insane because he's crafted a fantastic film. It's he has, like, yeah. And it's like, 
part of me wanted him to have a sort of parallel career, but part of me gets it that this is his one sort of non-documentary feature credit because yeah. if you can you imagine David Byrne doing something else after this? This is so David Byrne that you think, oh, that's the whole thing. That's the whole yeah. man in one film. I think the issue would be if he did something, even if he did something completely removed from the themes found in here, it would always feel like self-parody. Mm -hmm. This is a, a lightning in a bottle moment where he's made something so unique and it's so not critical, but it analyzes such a specific part of culture in the 80s if you try to replicate it or even move away from it, there's no drawing from the fact that most criticism of the film would be, well, true stories did it better or true stories yeah. did it differently. Yeah. And I think, you know, maybe it's, but I'm sure of it because he's got this other incredible parallel career, but there is a strength in knowing when to walk away. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's a shame that more people don't do that, mm. which is, you know, but that's that's a whole different conversation. I think it's good that David Byrne has sort of said, I can do this, I know how to do this, I have done it now. I think that's my film. It's sort yeah. of, he's not burnt out, he's not tired of it, he's enjoyed his time and he's moved back to what he does best, which is creating music. It's a very David Byrne attitude as well, isn't it? You can see it yeah. in his attitude towards certain genres or styles of music. Like, I would be very surprised, for example, if he made an ambient album now, because I, I wouldn't blame him for looking back at the stuff he did with Brian Eno and thinking, no, that's what I wanted to say about ambient music. You know, that hasn't changed. Yeah. That's it. It's. I mean, even the film's very David Byrne. I, I read somewhere that a lot of the extras were twins. Yeah, there's, there's like 50 pairs of twins in this for some and reason. I think it's it's the fact that it's not crucial to the narrative or any of the support and performances. It's not crucial at all. It's just the fact that he, he went and did it. Yeah. It's just there. It's like a little eccentricity that, you know, you pick up after a couple of scenes where it's like, oh, I've seen those people before. Now there's two of them. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's very burn. It's, you know, it's exactly what he would be doing with his music if he could visualise it. Mm, definitely, yeah. A couple of numbers uh, that we haven't really spoke about. I mean, in terms of people searching for something more than the suburbs can offer, I don't think there is a wilder example of this than the guy who sings Puzzling Evidence. <laughs> yeah. That is a lot more than the suburbs have to offer. That's... Yeah, it's. I think if if you look at Wild Wildlife, that's sort of the general consensus. But then if you look at that one, it's sort of it expands where I don't know. It's so you probably could speak a lot more about it than me because I'm still puzzled by it and I'm still so well <laughs> just sort of. <laughs> oh, here we go. All oh, right. <laughs> Puzzling Evidence is inspired by a parody religion created in the 1970s, I believe, called the Church of the Subgenius, uh, which was a, a satire on evangel evangelism, whose central notion was that their prophet, rather than being, you know, Muhammad or Moses or anyone like that, was a furniture salesman called J.R. Bob Dobbs. Uh, he was always pictured smiling with a pipe in his mouth. Uh, he didn't ask people to accept him as the Messiah, just his the short duration personal saviour or short do preserve for short. Um, it's very much in this kind of true stories ethos of satirising the idea of convenience and, you know, a kind of no waste you know, fast food, kind of easy, clean lifestyle. Uh, that's very much a, a subgenius target as well. But according to subgenius doctrine, uh, J.R. Bob Dobbs was martyred when he was assassinated by a man who gave his name as Puzzling Evidence. Uh, <laughs> there's a lot to take in there. Um, <laughs> so I know what scene you mean where sort of the preacher and he's the, um, talking heads of music is sort of linked slightly with evangelicism mm. and it's criticism of it you know you've got once in a lifetime the music video where burn got inspiration for the dance and the routine through evangelical uh broadcasts. yeah yeah and 
I suppose he really liked that theme because that and environmentalism are mm. the two key themes I would say make up the latter days of Talking Heads. Yeah. Where the evangelicalism is very present true stories and it makes more sense now that I've heard about <laughs> Bob Dobbs and his assassination <laughs> um, <laughs> and the doctrine and furniture. But as well, if you look at the album that they did after this, Naked, it's mm. The one that always sticks out for me, and I think it's because it's the only song on that album that I continue to listen to, is Nothing But Flowers. Yeah. Which is very on the nose, where it's, uh, we built a factory, now there are mountains and rivers, and sort of, it's very clear and very simple, and it's sort of process of, we should undevelop areas, we should mm. remove parking lots and fast food chains, and we should bring back, you know, flowers and rivers and streams, but he never touches upon that in true stories, but I do think it's a point to make between the link. The link between the two is that he's sort of obsessed with these little cultural oddities that are mm. affecting people. Where you know you've got the the preacher and he's raving and he's you know evidence and all this weird stuff, and it's so hard to. I'm really struggling to conceptualize it in words because it's such a difficult topic to talk about. But what, what I'm trying to get at is that Burns shift in what he's interested in is very clear in his music or his films. So at this point in time, there was nothing like the tabloid or the little mundane towns in his previous records. And I don't think there's much after it. I don't know, but especially environmentalism, that's sort of a naked based album concept rather than mm. you know, if you go back to I guess I mean even more more songs about buildings and food to an extent with the title, but I suppose that's a that's a concern maybe not with environmentalism as a kind of political cause, but with the idea of the environment of looking yeah. at the world people live in and ask, well, how, how do they live in that? How could they live in that more easily? Yeah, and I think it, that sort of ties in with this point about suburban living, where it's fine to be happy about that it's fine to be um sort of enjoying yourself in relative isolation of this concept but there is more out there you know it's not just yeah. shopping malls and fast food and little radio head adverts and stuff but it, it there is more but there are lots of people like in true stories that just don't want it yeah I think one of the things that is most interesting in the light of, as you say, uh, where his lyrics would go on Naked, um, is the attitude that the film takes towards big business, which is, I think, it may be essentially critical, but it's very ambiguous in a lot of ways. Yeah, I don't, I don't think there's any point in the film where he's specifically critical about anything. Mm. But I do think the big business stuff, it, I mean, that's always been a prevalent theme with mm. Talking Heads, and it's, it sort of makes sense that it would sort of weasel its way in here, and it works quite nicely. Um, it's kind of like he's making a prediction as to what might happen in the future. Yeah. Um, but I don't know how accurate he was with that. Well, there is one spectacularly dated moment where Spalding Gray quotes Steve Jobs and says something like, he was the guy who used to run Apple. <laughs> well, what a time capsule. Well, that is. <laughs> yeah, because he, a very big, quick tangent, he went off and did a different company, didn't he, to get rehired by Apple? I think he so did, I, yeah. I assume this came out during that rare pocket of time where Steve Jobs wasn't associated with Apple. <laughs> <laughs> They managed to capture the two-year period where he wasn't associated with shit phones, but <laughs> it's. Yeah. I think that's apart from that little scene there. I think True Stories is very. It manages to sort of shed the weight that comes with. Oh, this is a product of its time. This is themes that only associate with this time period. It's all. I think it is a rare film that will always be relevant, Definitely. even if it's yeah. less relevant twenty years down the line. Because suburban living's not going anywhere. No, and I think it's a shame. <laughs> it, it's the way that it looks at big business too is something 
where you know you, you can always dilute it to taste i think there is a part of the narrator and a part of burn as well that looks at these massive companies who are producing like microchips and other things that the people of the mid 80s could never have dreamed of before and sincerely yeah. thinks jesus that's really impressive yeah, and that comes through in the film. It's not just that this is a massive homogenizing force. It's not just the sort of drudgery of working on a production line or driving to a shopping mall that just looks like a big tin box. You know, there is a sense of actually this is this is interesting. It's as interesting as you know the building of the railroads or any other great American myth. Yeah, and it's sort of that. I mean, I don't mean the stereotype, but it's sort of that attitude of middle suburbia where it's like oh isn't that interesting mm. nothing they can do about it and there's no way they can get involved but they're they're interested in it not because yeah. they know how it works or what it means but they're interested in the opportunity it presents later down the line yeah yeah one of the few films that i think can stand as a, a precursor to true stories in which burn did uh, cite as an influence is a film by Errol Morris called Vernon, Florida. Okay. And there's a theory that the town, the fictional town that True Story is set in is called Virgil, Texas, as a tip of the hat to Vernon, Florida, because, you know, the other interpretation was Virgil is some reference to the Divine Comedy, but this does not feel like a descent into hell. <laughs> it really <Yeah>. doesn't. <laughs> I mean, there is that sort of... I, I can see why someone would read it as sort of a descent into hell if they're so opposed to this lifestyle. Mm. I think just, I mean, as av an average sort of audience member, I don't think I'd think... It's it's not this descent into hell. It's not this mania and madness and how mm. bad it is to be content because there isn't anything wrong with being content. But I definitely see where that intention and that reading comes from, where it's sort of, this is hell. This is horrible. How can people live like this? Yeah, yeah, perhaps. Yeah, think about, I'm, I'm not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Think about Vernon, Florida, um, which, it, which is a really interesting film. It's about like 45 minutes long, so well worth anyone's time to dig up. Um, Morris made it uh, because he'd wanted to do a film about this place that was nicknamed Nub City. It had the highest rate, of, oh, wait for it. <laughs> it had the highest rate of insurance fraud in the world um, because there was a ring of people there who had decided that they would deliberately chop off their bits of like their body in order to make false insurance claims. Uh, Morris did not make this film largely because the main guy in this insurance fraud ring like brandished his stump at Evel Morris and said, look, this is what I did to me. Imagine what I'm going to do to you if you make this movie. <laughs> so Vernon Florida just ended up as like a, a portrait of local eccentrics in this small town. Uh, and Morris was not a big fan of true stories. He did say, which uh, I should say this because although I totally disagree, I think it is a pretty cool diss. Uh, he said, the thing about true stories is it's not true and it's not a story. <laughs> <laughs> well, I suppose, I mean, is anything fiction wise fully true? Mm. I think that's yeah. the sort of semblance. Obviously, it's based on tabloids and it never feels like it's a caricature of tabloids. It never feels as if it's sort of prodding anyone or making fun of anything. It's very, you know, sort of somber. Almost, yeah. Where it's, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't agree with that criticism that he's made. Surely not because there is a story and it's a story about people living in Virgil, Texas. That's all you need. It's, you know, film has such a, a broad definition of the word story. And it, I think be true stories is, the opening, the opening credits just says it's a film about a bunch of people in Virgil, Texas. So you cannot yeah. claim there is any false advertising going on here, I think. The reason why I brought Morris up, though, is one of the things that I noticed when I rewatched this is that th that opening credit sequence where David Byrne narrates the whole history of Texas, like from the dinosaurs to the present day, 
all I love that scene. It's so great. It's so it's good. Fantastic. It looks an awful lot like the sort of filmmaking that Errol Morris would start to do after this, even down to the score, the, the collaboration that Byrne does with Meredith Monk for that piece of music sounds like the music that Philip Glass would make for a lot of Errol Morris's films. And I thought, is Morris protesting too much here? Because it, it is very strange that this film he doesn't like ends up predicting his next stylistic moves in this really uncanny way. Well, I think that says a lot about Morris as a director then, because if, if David Byrne is able to make a film that sounds and feels and looks like his next project, mm -hmm. then either David Byrne is living inside of his mind rent-free, or... <laughs> some degree of copycat behaviour where he's saying, I don't like this, it's neither true nor a story. I do like the technical elements and I will be taking those though. So it's, I don't know, surely, I mean, you know, even if it's sort of subconscious influence, even if it's the slightest sort of, oh, I like this bit of music, we should make it like this. Oh, it sounds like something I initially didn't like. Um, yeah, I can see true stories and actual, actually, you know, Burns direction very inspiring not, yeah. not for me but because i'm useless with stuff like that but for filmmakers down the line it's it's got to be you know i i don't know any examples of what this has influenced but i have a feeling it probably has influenced someone or something yeah i i can't like find many cases where so someone has specifically said something but i would be very surprised if wes anderson hadn't seen this film yeah, it is quite colourful. Mm. It's very vibrant, but also at the same time, when you're moving through the shopping mall, it's quite muted and it's quite grey and bland. But in a way that I think maybe it's the Criterion method of touching the film up and changing the colours somewhat. But I think comparing and contrasting that scene in the shopping mall with everything that comes before and after, you've, you know, you've got the nice colourful clubs, you've got the the um, the what you call it. I've forgotten the word for it. The talent show, the talent yeah, show at the end. Yeah. They're quite colourful, colourful, they're quite vibrant. You've got very block colours as a background, mm -hmm. and then you've got people in the foreground. The shopping mall's very grey. People are wearing yeah. lots of different colours and it's meant to be very vibrant, but it's all very muted and it's all very it doesn't have the same punch that the earlier scenes do. And some of it must come from Burn because, I mean, Ed Lackman is a great, great cinematographer. He shot a lot of Werner Herzog's early films, so he'll always have a place in my heart. But if you ask someone to shoot a talent competition in small town Texas, they are not going to come out with something that looks as stylized and as colourful and as weirdly glamorous in a way as the one in True Stories. It must be coming from Byrne. Yeah, it must be. I mean, if we take the album covers of Talking mm -hmm. Heads' releases, obviously you can see the sort of the inspiration that would have for true stories eventually if you take something not fear of music because that's sort of just very simplistic it's very metallic hmm. but if you take something like little creatures which came out i think it was either the year before it was it the year before this i think it was the year before yeah yeah that's always struck me and i think that's why the road to nowhere connections there for me is because road to mm -hmm. nowhere on that album it's the art on the front it's very vibrant it's very colorful it's all hand drawn it's all very intentionally amateurish and it, it mm. looks very you know it's it's not very regal it's not very large it's not very it's not the sort of thing that you would put on the front cover of a band who were as talking yeah. heads were starting to get really big on mtv and hit their commercial stride precisely yeah so if you take that little creatures concept as the artwork you can see where that's influenced and the people uh, appearing in True Stories, it's sort of vibrant, it's colourful, there's people just sort of dotted about the place, and True Stories is vibrant, colourful, and there's people dotted around the place, and it's just sort of, they're living their lives, and Burns stuck a camera in them. Yeah. There are people in True Stories that could probably pass as real people. Yeah. Oh, yeah, definitely. And and like I say, the, the thing is, for me, is that they're strange enough to be real. I think yeah. you know, people have this very wrong-headed view about what realism means. And 
we've almost got to the end of the podcast without properly singling out John Goodman. Uh, because yeah. what an amazing performance and what an amazing thing for Burns to have got him at this stage in his career. Because this is before he'd worked with the Coen brothers. This is like, I think this is one of his first leading roles, isn't it? Definitely, yeah. So yeah, yeah. To, to capture him at such a time when it's sort of, there's that raw passion and sort of, he's yet to be moulded into that Coen brothers support vehicle. Hmm. Which has been incredible for him in his late career. I do think True Stories is one of his best roles because completely, just, yeah, it's kind of just like he embodies a lot of what Byrne wishes to say, but not mm. to the point where it consumes what his character is, which is just a mm. friendly Texan living his days in a you know sad isolation. But he's trying to get himself out of that. And the thing is, of course, if you could write that role for John Goodman now, and I think in many ways it would be no different because Byrne has absolutely nailed what John Goodman's star persona is and what his appeal is on screen before anyone else had, before he was on Roseanne, before he was in Corn Brothers movies, you know, all of this is in the future. This is like the founding text of what I think is one of the great American screen careers. Yeah, I think it's, if, if you look at his career after this, you know, I mean, we mentioned Flintstones, but the sky was the limit after that, you know, he, he had Absolutely, so many Coen yeah. Brothers collaborations. I mean, even, you know, if, after Monsters, Inc. and stuff, you had, you know, 10 Cloverfield Lane, you had all, all these great films, Kong Skull Island even, as much as, you know, I don't know. But it's, he's there, he's present in all these big films. And I do think True Stories is the catalyst for that. Mm. I do think that captures what he can present because th there are moments that capture how great he is on his feet with comedy when he's yeah. saying, like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a consistent weird panda bear. That's great stuff. That's really knockout stuff. But then you've got the bit in the bar where he's talking to this woman and he just screams and he just starts shouting. Yeah. And it's obviously it's played in a nice way. It's not meant to be anything like villainous or horrible, but it does show his range as a sort of, he can just flip that switch yeah. and he can go from being this very placid individual who's just coasting through to very alert, very aware of his surroundings and very volatile. Yeah. No, he's, I mean, it's, it's he's an absolutely remarkable one-off actor and this is an absolutely remarkable one-off film so it couldn't be a better match in my opinion oh absolutely it's perfect the chemistry between them and i think it helps that burn is present alongside him on screen at times as well just to sort yeah. of guide his hand a little bit what would you give for a buddy cop movie with those two <laughs> If you take the actual if just don't change anything about it but if you take the concept of lethal weapon <laughs> you put John Goodman and David Byrne in it and give them both cowboy hats, set it in Virgil, Texas. It can have Spalding Gray as like a, a moustache twirling baron of oil. Yeah. Perfect. You could do it easily. On. Yeah. Oh, that'd be marvellous. Well, I mean, that, that that's the pitch. So we're going to have to go and check our email to see if anyone's got back to us offering to make that yet. Um, but until then, uh, that's been your lot from Pop Screen listeners. I've been Graham Williamson. I've been you and Gladwell. And we'll see you next week. Bye.